any time, if you have questions, don't wait for the end of the talk. Um, this will not really work very well. Um, what you're seeing here in the background is a thing you have seen many times before. It's a piece of aluminum foil crumpled together, like you will be throwing it away in a second, like chocolate paper or something like that. And you see all these ridges and intricate structures in here only because I've cut this piece of aluminum foil, this little ball, in the middle using X-ray tomography. So you're seeing a thin slice cut out of the middle of such a ball. Let me show you all of the slices. So we have the ball and a little rod. Now we're moving up the rod. We're starting to get inside this ball. You can see layer by layer how this unfolds here. Um, now the clue is gone, and you can just see this, all these ridges coming in and going out. I think, first of all, this is actually an aesthetically pleasing picture. I mean, when I first time saw that, I thought, this is nice. This, I, I've never seen the world surrounding me this way. And there's a good reason I've never done that. But um, there's also interesting physics to be done with that. Um, if you, if you have an extra experiment here talking about riches and, and, and crumbling stuff together. So this would allow you to have insight from the inside, to go inside such a sample. Okay. We can actually quantify how much more insight we can get out of tomography. Everyone knows that a picture is worth a thousand words. So if we move on and go to something which is 3D, actually we have thousand times to one point half power, which gives about 30,000 words. So we can really have a lot of more insight by just doing a 3D image of something instead of doing a slice. What you see on the top is the system, which is very similar to the one you were actually doing in the hands-on session. It's a container containing, in this case, glass beads. And again, it's just one slice cut through the whole sample of glass beads. If you put all those slides together, you get a stack, and that stack actually gives you what? So that stack gives you then a chance to analyze it and find the particle positions like here in 3D, and then do things like the Voronoi tessellation that Mark has been talking about, only do it in 3D. Okay. The basic outline of this talk is the following. I'm going to first talk to you a little bit about X-ray imaging. A lot of it might be known to some of you from, from other courses, but I think it's good to have back the basics all together to understand how do we do a good X-ray image. Then, um, how does actually tomography work? We have these 2D projection images. How do we create a 3D image out of those projection images? Then, the probably the most important thing, how do you get started using it in your own research day-to-day uh, -day work? And finally, I have a couple of special topics. I'm not sure if I have the time to go all of them, but there's some extra hints which might be helpful if you want to get started on things. Um, you all know that X-rays is just another form of electromagnetic waves, so we're just moving up a little bit in the frequency or down the wavelength compared to our visual spectrum, which is over here. And um, so we expect them to actually be rather similar to what we know already, except that we don't have sensors for them and we, can't, we don't have actually sources for X-rays. The reasons, or we oh, for a long time didn't have sources for X-rays, let me put it that way. The reason for that is um, that X-rays cannot be created by black body radiation. Almost all light sources mankind invented first were actually making something really, really hot. And then it emits, X, um, it emits black body radiation. And that black body radiation, for example, if something is 5,000 Kelvin warm, is right into the visible range. Um, so you can use a fire. You can use a little metal wire, which is heated up by electrons. You create visible light. Now, to move over to X-rays, you would have to heat up something to hundreds or thousands of Kelvin or something like that. So there is no way we could have done that by the usual way we learned to actually create light. So we had to come up with new ways of creating X-ray source. And that was about 100 years ago when Mr. Röntgen invented this X-ray tube. So what you have here is an evacuated glass tube. And you have a um, filament over here, which is heated up. Oh, sorry which is heated up, and by it's heated up, it emits thermal electrons. So it's just moving around that um, uh, cathode over there. And then we put on a high voltage supply, which accelerates our electrons towards the, uh, the anode. And while they go over to the anode, they acquire kinetic energy, which is proportional to their uh, um, charge times the voltage we apply, so they have a really high kinetic energy. They bump into the anode, and while they bump in there, they create X-rays, which we then can use to eliminate um, our samples. Now, this bumping is very hand-waving. We can do this a little bit more precise. There's actually two different mechanisms which create X-rays. One is called Bremsstrahlung. What you have is an electron coming in, seeing the electrons of the atoms in the material, and getting bent or decelerated or changing its course or maybe even completely stopped. And every time you decelerate an, a charge, you actually create, you create photons, you create electromagnetic waves. 
And because the way, the exact way how the electron can be decelerated inside these atomic orbitals can be very different, you're actually not getting only one specific um, energy, you get a broad spectrum of energies depending on the exact details of that collision. There's a second way of creating um, X-rays, which is the characteristic emission. So the electron actually bumps out one electron, which is already in shell somewhere there. Once the electron is missing, the atom is not happy, and a new electron is falling down, and because it's going between very distinct energy levels, it's actually sending out a photon with a very precise uh, wavelength. Putting that two mechanisms together, you get a spectrum which typically looks something like that. So here you have a photon flux, that's photons per area and time. And down here you have the energy of the photons coming out of this. In this case, it's a tungsten anode. And you have four different curves. These four different curves correspond to four different acceleration voltages. And you can see that each of these curves, AD, 100, 120, 140 kilovolts, ends exactly at that energy level. You can't create photons with more energy than what you actually have put into the electrons while accelerating them towards the target. You cannot put, get more high, uh, higher energy photons out of that. You can also see that the characteristic radiation might be very strong in a very small energy band, but overall the most photons are actually in the Bremsstrahlung. So you have to worry much more about what is going on there than going on in these little characteristic radiation bands. Okay, that's the way you can create X-rays. Um, one thing you need to know when doing so is that X-ray tubes are horribly inefficient. About 99% of the energy you put in by accelerating the photons, you actually just convert into heat. Only 1% comes out of um, as X for photons. That is a problem because um, this much heat, you try normally to have a very small spot. You want to have, you have in a second, you want to have geometric optic, you want to have a very focused, small focused spot. And that small focused spot, you're dumping a lot of energy, which means that if you're not careful, you're actually just melting away your target. So you're limited naturally by the heat flux out of that focal spot, which how strong of a photon flux you can create. And I will show you in a second that photon flux is everything in X-ray tomography. Okay, now you created the X-rays, they come out of the tube, they will start interacting with matter, and it depends on what they find there. The first thing to keep in mind is, if you think about electromagnetic waves, you normally think about something like Snell's law. Some wave comes in, change, crosses the interface between two different materials. These two different materials have two different interface index of refraction, and actually this, the electromagnetic wave gets bent over. That's how we make lenses, for example. Well, this is something we don't need to worry about for um, X-rays because the uh, index of refraction, N, is one minus delta, and delta is a very, very small number over basically all the photon range, so it's 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus seven for different materials. So basically, X-rays just go straight on. They're not getting bent. They get absorbed, they get scattered, but they're not getting bent over. So we have just purely geometric optic and don't need to worry about things like lenses. Actually, that's a problem because sometimes you would like to have a lens. You, it's very, very hard to build something like that. Um, so what we have is then directly geometric imaging. So as I already said, we typically have an X-ray tube where we create at a very small focus spot a lot of X-rays, and then they come out and it just goes straight on, pass through some material they're interested in, and end up on some camera um, over here. And because of this cone beam geometry, we have magnification because everything over here gets just expanded when it empty fans finally up at the, uh, the CCD screen. And we can compute the magnification by just comparing the length. So by moving the object closer to the target or closer to the camera, we control the magnification without any lenses in there. That's the classical X-ray imaging setup. That's what you do in a medical uh, doctor, chest X-ray or anything, dental X-ray. Um, and it's called a radiogram. A single individual's uh, picture taken that way is a radiogram. Now, um, the thing you need to also remember from your physical chemistry or whatever entry class is that the actual absorption, the interaction with the material happens because this, the scattering and absorption is governed by this lambert bear law. So if this is your X-ray source, it's your X-ray beam coming out, it has an intensity I0 over here, a certain number of photons per time, and if it has passed the material, it's hadn't gone down to I. And if material of the thickness, the, the X over here is the one thing which determines what, how the image looks like. For example, again, this image of the walnut. The other thing which it determines is the attenuation coefficient. Different materials have different attenuation coefficients. These attenuation coefficients only depend on the electrons of the atoms the X-rays are actually encountering. There is no chemistry dependence. For a perspective in X-rays, it's called totally, it doesn't really matter if you have like a cube of sugar or if you put about the same amount of carbon coal and hydrogen and oxygen atoms 
and the same path length. As long as the X-ray encounters the same numbers of old atoms, it will see the same attenuation. There's no chemistry at all involved in that uh, type of imaging. There's different ways of doing chemistry of X-rays, but not in the imaging. Um, okay, and then you end up with the lambert bear law. So to get these two attenuation, to get the two intensities into together, you just have an exponential factor which goes with this attenuation coefficient and the length of the beam, which is actually the material passing. Um, if you have different materials, like with this walnut down here, you have the flash inside the walnut and you have the shell, what you do is you actually just sum up over the whole length of the path the attenuation coefficients times the length of the different materials which go over there. And this sum will later on come back again as an integral if we go and analyze what is actually going on in tomography. If you wonder what is the actual attenuation of a certain material, there is a very nice service by uh, NIST. There's a database you can go, and on that database you'll find all the attenuation coefficients beside other things for a very broad range of energies from 1 keV to 100 GeV. So that's much more than you want to know, believe me. And um, you can really search that database easily with this form, and you can just download all the data you need to analyze to predict how strong the actual attenuation will be, which you're observing. Now I've done that, and I added it up for certain materials. Now what you see here is the X-ray attenuation coefficient as a function of the photon energies for four different materials, glass, water, polyethylene, and air. Um, so you, you read that, if you say, okay, I would have an X-ray photon of 100 keV, then this would, for a glass, for example, give me something like 0.8, one over centimeter attenuation. Um, you can see several things over here. First of all, it's really depending on the energy, and to understand this depends precisely, we would now have to talk about different mechanisms which do actually scattering and the attenuation inside the X-rays, but that's actually beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here, and as a user, you don't really need to know that. You just need to have that curve. And you also see that you want to have contrast, but contrast is better over here than over here, and we will come back to some of that. But if you typically have an object, let's say, out of glass or polyethylene in air, the contrast between the, the plastic and the, the air is large, is huge. It doesn't really depend so much on what photon energy you have. You always will get a probably a very nice image of that. Keep in mind also that the X-ray setup we will be using here just goes up to something about 550 keV. So we can't really access that range over here, but that's, for example, medical X-rays often work in that range 100 to 300 keV. Okay. An important and very annoying thing is the following. The X-ray spectrum changes while it passes the material. As I already showed you, the attenuation is much higher for low photon energies, so they get filtered out much faster than for high energies. That means if I go with my X-ray beam, for example, I have a spectrum here from my 120 keV tungsten anode tube. If I measure the spectrum directly at the anode, I get this red curve. If I go for 75 centimeters of air, I get the blue curve, which is a little bit below. I filled it out of something of it, but not a lot. But then if I go, for example, um, through, uh, what is that, yellow? Should be something, some millimeters of, of aluminum. If I go for, oh, let's take the, yeah, the, the yellow curve is if I go to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, that could be, for example, the sidewall of your container. You see that in the high energy range, you almost not lost any of the photons. But in the low energy range, this is completely gone. Everything to 20 keV is completely out of your beam. That means while penetrating through, through the material, the X-ray is changing, the X-rays are changing in the spectrum. And that change in spectrum is not accounted for for the lambert bear law. The lambert bear law actually is only strictly correct with a constant coefficient of attenuation if you have only a monochromatic beam. But because you have a polychromatic beam which changes while it's penetrating, if you still want to keep the lambert bear law, it looks to you like your attenuation coefficient is actually becoming a function of the thickness you have. This is called beam hardening. So for example, here's different materials. It's actually all glass, BK7 glass. So the three curves over here, 60, 100, and 140 keV, that's different um, spectra, which has uh, different acceleration voltage we had at the electrode. So you get different spectra out of here. That's the attenuation coefficient we've measured. And you can see it's going down. The thicker the glass becomes. And it saturates against some value. At some point, you basically have removed all of the low energy photons out of your spectrum, and the remaining photons more or less behave like they would be monochromatic, but this takes a while. So lambert bears law is an approximation which is strictly with a constant attenuation coefficient only valid for monochromatic energies. If you're not having monochromatic energies, you have to take into account this beam hardening. 
And I come back to that because this is a big nuisance in taking images and uh, some of you will actually see that in the experiment if they have something in there which has, for example, some metal, you will see artifacts which come exactly from this effect. But then come back to that. Okay, finally, yeah? yeah? So yeah, yeah. The slide before that one. So yeah. You're talking about this peak? Yeah. This is. No, this, this peak is just completely filtered out. There is no photons of that energy left. That's a characteristic radiation again. So the L alpha beta tells you which shell is falling into what other shell. But these photons basically are all gone after you pass 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. They've been completely filtered out. So where is the second peak is always there. You just can't see it up here. There's red and blue is still here on the top. It's not like these peaks are shifting in energies. It's just hard to see. The, okay, I should have pointed that out. The, the red and blue peak are right on top of the yellow and the green peak. It's just going down in intensity, but not as much as this peak. Okay. Right. How much of that would you have left? Um, let me come back to your question. You're actually addressing the way, of one of the ways to mitigate a problem, and I have an extra slide for that further down in the talk. But, but you, you're addressing exactly the way how you can mitigate that. Okay, so, yeah? Does that uh, affect the, the, the use of X ray bricks in studying materials that are changing, say, Granular materials that are moving. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will show you, if I have the time, I will show you a movie in about 10 minutes where we have tried, we had a box of sand, we shake that, we tried to compute a packing fraction. And the numbers were wrong for a long time, and we thought ourselves, why, how can the numbers be so wrong? And then we said, okay, it's beam hardening. And once you put in beam hardening in our analysis, the numbers became correct. This is, this is everywhere. This is not an effect which is just limited to certain specific experiments or so. Okay, um, once you have your X-rays passing your object, you have to turn them into a signal. Well, for light, we all know we have CCD cameras down here. That's a CCD camera. But the CCD camera is basically blind to these high energies. So what we do is we put a scintillator screen directly in front of it or in some distance. That's typically some rare earth metals which have the property that they convert X-ray photons and photons of visible light. And these photons of visible light are then just detected by a standard CCD camera. There's other ways, there's semiconductor detectors in the meantime and so on, but that's still the most standard way, a scintillator in front of a CCD camera to get a decent image. Um, keep in mind that this is a, a stochastic process, so there's a finite probability Q that a photon is actually detected. It's not that every photon is detected, and that probability Q depends on the detector and the energy. Now, if you would sit down on, if you take a detector, you have something standing in front of you to take x-rays, and you don't change any of the geometry, you just keep on taking images. In a perfect world, of course, you would have at a certain pixel, a certain intensity, computed by lambert Baer's law. But because both the creation of the x-ray photons and the actual detection of the x-ray photons are stochastic processes, you actually get a fluctuation intensity. So this is the intensity of two different pixels inside such a static arrangement, and it fluctuates around the mean value. Actually, if you go in and do all the math, you find out that these photon energies, are, sorry, the photon counts are Poisson distributed, and that's basically the case for almost all imaging problems. It's just, as I will show you in a second, that for X-ray tomography, noise is specifically detrimental, and we have to keep it down as much as possible. So if we know it's Poisson distributed, we can also say the mean value is um, proportional to the detection probability times the photon flux. So yeah, and it's the photon flux coming in at that pixel, um, so that's the mean value, and the uh, variance is in a Poisson distribution also given by Q times N star. So that means if I want to have a figure of merit, a signal-to-noise ratio, I divide my mean value, the average gray value of that pixel, by the standard deviation of the fluctuations around that mean value, and use the knowledge that I have Poisson distribution, I derive that this signal-to-noise ratio only depends on the square root of Q times the mean photon flux. Q is something I cannot change. I have already picked the camera, so that's static. The only thing I can change is the photon flux. And 
That's why we never have enough photons. We, 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 if we get 10 times more photons coming in, we only improve our signal to noise ratio by a factor of about three. So, um, that's a, but that's a rather very standard thing in almost all of image creation. It's just that in x-rays, it specifically hits us in point later down the road. So, um, if you take x-ray, if, if you have a sample and you go to an x-ray machine and you want to take an x-ray image of it, one of the first questions is, okay, how much acceleration voltage do I actually use for that? I mean, I have, you have this knob, you can go between typically, or in our machine, you can go between 25 and 45 or 50 kV, and other machines, you can go between 30 and 150 or 170 kV. So what is the acceleration voltage you can use? Now, if you go back to this diagram and say, okay, we have a, f uh, a photon energy which is down here in the um, low energy range we actually get a pretty good material contrast. All of those lines are separated pretty well. So if a material has different things in there, different, um, different um, chemical compositions, we can probably distinguish them pretty well. On the other side, the overall attenuation is rather large on that side of the spectrum. Large attenuation means very few photons will reach our detector. That means we will have a bad signal to noise ratio. So that's the one side of it. If we go to the other side, well, all of those lines are now pretty close next to each other, so the contrast between different materials really goes down, and it's becoming much, much harder to, to image something or to compose of simple things. But we have a smaller attenuation, so that means our photon goal count goes up, and we, that's good for a signal to noise ratio. So that's basically the trade off we always have if you do an x ray image. And you have to figure out, depending on what you have, what is the best thing. Typical rule of thumb is high contrast images of things like biological specimen, you're better off. Um, paying the price of low photon energies. Um, if you have something like metal in there or thick layers of, of yeah, metal or something, you always go up to high photon energies and the rest you need to exper have experience how to do it. There's a couple of tricks. One of very nice tricks is one of your phases is liquid where you can dope this liquid phase with some salt which has a high order number. Like in this case, cesium iodide is pretty far from the attenuation. So even small concentrations like half a mole of cesium iodide will make your liquid very well visible. This is, for example, used over here. There's a slice, no, this is from a tomography already, not an X-ray image, slice for a tomography of sand which has been wetted by a liquid. And you would normally have a hard time distinguishing between the liquid and the, the grains, the different grains, and, and there's liquid bridges in between them. But because they added zinc iodide to the liquid, you can very nicely see where the water bridges between the different sand grains are. So that's a way to, to bump up your contrast. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about X-ray tomography, but let me point out that radiography is also a great tool. You might, if you have access to an X-ray system, and you might even not want to go for the tomography because it's so time consuming, you can only do static things, especially if you have something which is dynamic. X-ray radiograms can be much, much faster. So this is work which has been done in collaboration with the people from the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, by the way, the Fraunhofer Institute, which also built our CD portable, and you probably know it from your MP3 player. So they are the guys who invented the MP3 protocol. So they are doing really a broad range of different things, and this CT stuff is one of them. Um, so there's a collaboration with Fraunhofer and Norman Ullmann from there, and Jonathan Kolmer from our group. What you see up here is an X-ray camera. There's a small box of sand on some guarding, on some rail, which can be shaken. Here you see a top view of that sample, which can be shaken this way. And up here you see an X-ray tube, which is then going to illuminate this sample box in here. But if we do that, well, um, again, this is our sandbox. If take such a sandbox and shake it horizontally, various things happen. There's a convection roll going on in there and a lot of interesting dynamics. But one thing which is rather peculiar has been found by Torsten Puschel um, some years ago is that if you pick one point in the height of that surface, you just study that point in, in, as a function of time. So there's a time lapse of one of these points in the middle of the box. You can see that the system seems to be breathing. It's expanding and shrinking, expanding and shrinking. And the time scale of that breathing motion is on the order of two to three seconds. It's very, very different from any other time scale we have in the system. The convectional time scale is different. The shaking time scale is different. And it's also completely different symmetry. We shake it this way. Why would then the sample go up and down? There's no real reason to understand that. So that was something we were really asking ourselves, can we understand, what is the mechanism behind that? Why is that actually breathing? This, there is no real surface pattern. It's not like the vertically shaking stuff. It's really just a, so. So there is there is a flow coming in. There's a convection roll going in, but overall the surface stays rather flat. There is no no undulations or wave length you would discern from that. It's just the whole system goes up and goes down, goes up and goes down. 
Okay, so what we did is we took X-ray images, and um, here it's just a grayscale image, so you can see the box. Um, we take the images while we shake them, so we synchronize the shaking motion in the X-ray camera, so that's it. therefore the box seems to be static standing there, but actually we're shaking it with 75 hertz back and forth for a couple of millimeters. And if we now analyze this gray value profile over here, and if we know the lambert bear law, and if we know the beam hardening, that was actually the necessary ingredient to get the numbers correct, then we can compute the volume fraction of the sand averaged along the path through that box. So just from these gray values, you can see that in these gray values over here, which we look at this blue box, there are some stripes here which are brighter than the rest of it. These brighter stripes correspond actually to a dip. There's less sand here. There's a layer of sand which is more dilute than the remaining sand. This layer of sand, the dilute sand, comes from the fact that the stuff on top of it is actually moving back and forth, and the sand below it is actually static, and you get a shear band between these two areas, and in this shear band, sand gets, becomes more diluted. And now if I start a movie, and you can see what the dynamics of the system is, so keep in mind it's synchronized, so the box is really moving, you can see that these bands of, of dilution form, and then they travel upwards periodically. Again, here you get a packing fraction out of it, and we can show that once a band reaches the top surface or comes as close as it gets, actually sand collapses down, a new band forms. So this production of this breathing mode really depends on how many bands are actually in there and how expanded are they. So there's a strict connection between that. The red dots are actually tracer particles we have added in there. So this is um, little particles which are higher extra attenuation, and they show you this convection wall. So you can see, if you see, that they're actually going like that. There's a convection wall on the side over here. But this convection wall phenomenon is independent of this uh, shear band phenomenon. Yeah? Is this uh, shaking like a vertical shaking? No, I, I take the box and shake it like that. Horizontally, only horizontally. So, the, so the, the box is really going like this. You're just not seeing it because it's synchronized with the X-ray. Uh, like, what is the magnitude of 25? Um, that was uh, 1.5 millimeters, I think. And the box is something like 10 centimeters to give you a scale. And width. It seems to be appearing and disappearing, but it looks like there's kind of an inverse tornado. An inverse? The at the bottom? Yeah. You mean like? Up like this. Yeah, now, now I see it. It's kind of like going up. It's kind of like a tornado that's upside down. Okay, I would be interested to talk to you later about this tornado uh, because I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're seeing. But yeah, yeah, from here, oh, this one, this one. Yeah, yeah. so we, we, we get, indeed, we get another shear band over here which we don't understand okay. because apparently the, the motion which we are pretty sure is rather small. We added, we have another image where we added more tracer particles, so we have a rather good idea of the actual motion of the grains, and there is almost no motion down here, so we don't really understand very, very wide there's a... You made the box more quasi 2D, do you still get this kind of thing? No, at some point it vanishes. So it's it, 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 if it's close to the walls, this, this kills it. No. No, the volume fraction is changing, you're correct, but the thickness of the box is not changing. Right. The thickness, the length is the same, so the beam goes along the whole box. No, so the volume fraction could affect. The volume fraction will change, right. right. It will affect the it, Yeah, well. but if you know an analytic expression how the volume fraction depends on the length, you can actually compute it back. So we first measured how the volume fraction, we, we took another sample, and this other sample we measured how does the, the yeah, we do both. We, we need a calibration measurement which is independent of that measurement, otherwise we cannot get the numbers here. Okay? Uh, these trace particles, what is the significance of uh, placing them inside when it, the motion is almost random? Um, well, we, no, no, there is these convection rolls, and the question was, is this, are these convection rolls responsible for the shear bands? So we needed to show that these shear bands are actually a separate phenomenon from these convection rolls. That's why we had this other experiment. Also, I can show you, I mean, okay, I don't have it here, but if you're interested, I can show you the paper. We can sh I can show you that exactly the point where the shear band is, the tracer particles on top of the shear band, they move much, much faster than the tracer particles below the shear band. That's our proof that it actually really is a shear band. Okay, so that's silicon radiograms. We have not done anything tomography here, and I'm seeing, um, so, so, yeah.
Hello. Okay, let's let's talk about how does tomography actually work. If we have talked about radiograms. Um, when I first worked with tomography founders, it's kind of a black box. So you buy this machine, and this machine takes all these radiograms, and then you get, like here, you have this walnut in there. It takes an image, it rotates it a little bit, it takes another image. It takes a whole stack of images over 360 degrees, and the more images you take, the better the quality is. And it takes this whole stack of radiograms and gives you back a 3D volume. So you have a 3D matrix X, Y, Z, and every part in that 3D matrix corresponds to the attenuation coefficient at exactly that space. How is it actually doing that? I mean, it's, see, they don't, well, you can read it up in books, but the machine you buy has the software already together with it. You don't have to program that yourself anymore, luckily. You just buy it. Um, yeah, that's the 3D volume. Okay, to explain how it works, I'm going to talk now about a 2D slice. So I'm taking one slice, as if this is my sample, I'm not just talking what happens in one slice. Like I have a line scan camera over here, and I move this line scan camera around the sample, so I have like just a single image over here. So that's my x-ray source, that's my slice for the object, and that's what my line scan camera sees. Um, in fact, I'm actually computing something which is called projection or projection integral. So again, if this is the, the setup over here, I have this lambert bear law which says, okay, the intensity at the detector is the intensity coming in times the h function minus the integral of all the mu coefficients along the path which the photons have been taken. Now I can do a little bit of mani algebraic manipulation and um, especially I turn around, I have now I0 on top, ID down here, I take the logarithmus, logarithm and then I find out that actually I, from my intensities I can compute something which is the integral of the attenuation coefficients along the path. So my photons, so to speak, compute me that integral at each point, at each path they're going through. And that is then called a projection integral or a projection. It's this P over here, so um, it computes the integral over mu. There is no mu over here. The path coming in here is not going to see any of the materials over here. The projection integral is zero. And then it becomes larger the larger the actual attenuation coefficients along the path over here. Is in. So we assume the divide areas have a higher attenuation than the gray areas. And then we would become something like this projection integral. So that's one measurement of my line scan camera after I run just this little normalization over here. Um, the overall tomography probably can be described the following way. I have this first line scan integral, and I rotated it by the guy Sorry, angle. I don't understand what C, C is what? C. C, C is the space. C, C. So, so xi, xi is, yeah, I should have said that. Xi is the, is the, the length along my, my line scan camera. So that's basically the pixel number, if you want. That, that's the number of pixels. Yeah, sure, sorry for that. Um, now I'm going to rotate my, my setup. I take another integral, another image of my line scan camera, and I get another projection integral. And now my P, my projection integral, not only depends on xi, the pixel number, but it also depends on the angle which I have been taking it. And I take more of those images again. I get a series of these integrals. And the problem I have to know is now is an inverse problem, where I take all these projection integrals and project them back into the volume and want to know the mu of x and y inside that volume where I actually get it from. That's what tomography has to solve. This is just something which is, is, is not just the explanation, it's just a way which is typically considered. If we use this as a phantom, so we assume this is our slice, our particles, these are glass particles in a container, these are mu's, they're very high over here. If I now take this, all these projection integrals, I always get like one line of intensity. So if I have um, 180 rotation angles, for example, I get 180 lines. And I put all those lines below each other. I have the sensor position psi over here and the rotation angle over here. I get something which is called the, the sinogram. The sinogram is just a way of visualizing all these projection integrals into one nice picture instead of all these other individual curves. So the intensity, that's the projection integrals as an intensity, that's the angle, and that's the center position. So this radiogram, uh, sorry, the sinogram is now the, the basis from what we were going to do the reconstruction. Let me remind you again what Mark Shaddock told you on Monday morning. You can do Fourier transform in 2D. A typical space of Fourier modes looks like this. This is at least the way MATLAB represents it. In the middle, you have the so-called DC mode. So that's just the average gray value of the image you're looking at after Fourier transform. And then surrounding it, you have all the different waves. So this is just the Fourier mode, which fits in one time, four, five, seven, whatever times into your image. And in the horizontal line, they're all aligned horizontally. In the vertical line, they're all aligned vertically. And depending where you are, the angle is different. So. Um, 
wavelength decreases from the center outward. So the largest wavelength is inside here and the smallest wavelength is on the outside. That's the picture of the Fourier space you need to keep in mind for the following discussion. Of course, we have the complex variables here and the phase and amplitude and so on, but that doesn't end anything about a wavelength picture in that. Now, let's step back for a second and say, okay, let's assume we would already know the attenuation coefficients in here and we would compute from our knowledge a Fourier transform of that. How would that look like? Well, I just take the uh, Fourier transform equation that Mark has been showing to you. I have these two wave numbers, u and v. Here is my attenuation coefficients, and here is my E functions with the two um, terms, u times x and v times y. Now, and that would be then the, the coefficients. These would give me the different, I put in different u's and v's, and I get different amplitudes, and that those amplitudes I would use to populate my Fourier space over here, if I would know it that way. Let's first, for the sake of the argument, assume we are only considered in the coefficients along that line u. We ignore everything else of the Fourier space, so we set a v to zero. If v is to set to zero, we really say, okay, zero is over here, u and v, so we only see coefficients along that way. Now, we drop that second term here in our exponential functions. We are only left with the u times x term in here. But this allows us to simplify the integral. We can now put the attenuation with together with the integral over dy because the e function doesn't depend on y any longer. It's only depending on x, and we can take it out of the integral. And that is, however, what is inside here is exactly the projection integral we had. So what, is there, what I've written down here is nothing else than for this specific assumption that I said one of the lines zero, I get the Fourier transform of my projection integral. And that's the Fourier slice theorem. I have not talked about one specific line. This is valid for any possible line, for any possible projection integral I could look at. I can use any angle uh, like gamma which I want. And for each one of them, I have the fact that the Fourier transform of the projection integral populates me a certain line in my Fourier space, the, Fourier, the line which is parallel to it. So what I can do now is I can take all my different lines of my sinogram, Fourier transform each of these lines, and each of these lines will populate me my Fourier space along one line going through the center. So if I take this line, for example, this line over here would be that line. If I move down one more line, I'm going to change the angle slightly, gamma becomes slightly larger, and so on and so off. But in the end, I have something like that. I have all my different projection integrals populate me. So these are the Fourier modes I've put into my Fourier space by analyzing the Fourier transform of all these projection integrals. And this is not what I need exactly. I have now some idea how the Fourier modes look like, but if I want to do a Fourier back transform from the Fourier space to the real space, I actually need something like that. I need to know my coefficients on this rectangular grid. These, that's, these are the, the even spaced out Fourier modes, or the, the gray dots over here, are the evenly spaced out Fourier modes which I need to know to do the back transformation. And I've gotten from my um, Fourier slice theorem, which I just showed you, I've gotten points along these diagonals. That means I've gotten a much higher density of information around the center for the long wavelength, and a much lower density of information the further I go out. The higher the wavelength is, the lower my information density becomes, the fewer points are there. And now, doing my back transformation, I have to interpolate all those gray points over here for much less information which I actually have. And that's why actually free transformed, the back transformation, the radon transformation, requires a high pass filter. I'm overvaluing the, the high frequency information. I have less of it and I have to amplify it, so to speak, to fill in all my, my lack of information. And that's why free transfer, sorry, why tomography is so noise sensitive because the radon transformation, this first slice frame, gives me information about what is going on inside there, but it gives me more information about the low wavelength modes than about the high wavelength modes. We, we, somehow, yes, we, we not correlate, but um, the, the, the pink points over here, that's uh, the different amplitudes we get from, so, so each line of this corresponds to one projection integral. And we did a Fourier transform of this one projection integral. And the Fourier slice stream said, oh, once you've done the Fourier transform, you've got some amplitudes. These amplitudes are actually lying along this diagonal line over here. So we filled in basically these, I don't know, these 15, 20 points over here in our Fourier space. However, if you want to do the back transformation, 
because we in the end want to know what is the actual system is, we cannot use that. That's not on the grid we use. We actually need to know the gray points over here on that grid. So, for example, if you want to know this gray point, something we can do, we can interpolate maybe this and this pink point to get the closest possible value to understand what the free transform at that point would be. But this interpolation step becomes less and less good the further out we go because the less information we basically have. That, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's summing up the whole tomography progress, so to speak. So we start by having some slice of some image over here. Um, we do a radon transform, so we for all the projections, we get this projection integral, we just sum them up all together, and um, that's the result from what we actually did this down here, this radon transformation, that's actually the result which we measured by our tomography. So this line scan camera has given us the sinogram, sinogram. Now, the black box inside our tomograph does two things. It first takes the Fourier slice theorem and uses the sinogram to populate the Fourier space with all those lines. And then it does an inverse Fourier transform to give us back the distribu spatial distribution of the news. Now, this is the idea. Of course, the actual algorithm do something which is slightly to vastly different. But overall, um, that is what happens in the back transformation of the Fourier transform. Okay, and just to sum that up, because we have this little information on the boundaries and the high frequency range, that's why Fourier tomography is so sensitive to noise and why it really matters how good our signal to noise ratio is much more than for other image modalities. And here is an image example, for example, this is Van Phantom, and then just added 2% of Gaussian noise to the sinogram and back transformed it, and it's already hard to recognize. With 5%, you basically start losing all the features in there. So this is much more sensitive than normal other, many other methods. Okay, this is the time to address the elephant in the room. This is a school on hands-on experiments, and I'm talking about X-ray tomography. Um, X-ray tomography, even though we have a hands-on device, is not what you typically would consider to be something which is tabletop. Um, let me give you a small answer why it still might be something you might want to consider. First of all, okay, that's the machine I brought with us from the front of the institute. Um, it comes at a price tag of 55,000 euros, which is already a pretty good price tag. And given its limitations that, for example, you can go only about 10 millimeters in aluminum and 45 millimeters in plastic, that limits you, and also the relatively small size of your sample, that's a pretty strong limitation. If you want to buy something which is more general, for example, what we had before in Göttingen is this nanotome for GE sensing inspection. Nanotome because it actually can resolve two gold lines which are separated by 500 nanometers but only gold lines. If you have a bad worse contrast, it doesn't do anything in nanometer range. Um, then your price tag is in the 350 kilo euro range, and that's definitely not tabletop anymore. Um, there's, two, there's two options, two main options, why I think you might still be able to use that technique. One of them is that medical CT scanner are now ubiquitous in, in, in almost anywhere. I mean, if you look a little bit around, you will find a place which has a medical CT scanner. And these medical CT scanners, they might not be as good in spatial resolution than the others. Okay, they only have like 0.3 millimeter of this voxel size. By the way, voxel is the 3D equivalent of a pixel, so this little cube is a voxel. Though they have a voxel size of 300 millimeters, that's much worse than what we have. But you get other nice perks. For example, you have a speed of 140, 125. 42 milliseconds for one image. That's much, much faster than a nanotome can do. So if you have, if you find a way of getting access to a medical x-ray, you can do a lot of science with that. And just as a proof of concept, actually, let me show you the results by Ralf Janarius and Tamas Bazzoni. They study a granular system. There's a split bottom cell. It's very similar to the Taylor Coet cell, actually. Only they don't fill it with um, liquid. They fill it with granular media. They fill it with these little rods over here, which are little wood packs, so to speak. And then they went to a medical facility and just put their container, their split bottom cell on that table where the patient is normally lying and take images of um, all the packs in there and then you're done. You have your 3D data set and all coming downwards from there is image analysis, which you can do with just any desktop PC. And, and they got nice results out of that. So here is the um, alignment of the packs here. This is the this shear zone. If you split chief move the split bottom, you can see that the packs and the shear zone align much more, and you can make nice analogies with liquid crystals, for example. Then there's another option. You can build your own tomography. So actually, my own exposure, first exposure in 2006, was with a self-built setup at a setup um, in ANU in Canberra. Tim Sandon has built that. So what you see in the background, that's the X-ray camera. 
that's the, the X-ray tube. And there's a little rotation table over here. And on top of that, you see my fluidized bed, which I have been using when I was there to actually study granular media inside a fluidized bed. And, and that machine is in a lead cladded room. And that was one of the first machines I know where physicists have actually built something like that. You can do that um, also with less work. For example, this is a setup which has been in Heinrich, built in Heinrich Jäger's lab in the University of Chicago by an ex extraordinary undergrad, actually, Adanasiadis. I probably mispronounced that, sorry. Um, he built that as an undergrad, built a whole X-ray setup. Not only the X-ray setup, but actually on top of the X-ray setup, he built an Instron a machine which can put a pressure, which measured very precisely on that. And he's taking X-rays with that. And he has written a very nice review of scientific instrument paper, which gives you all the ins and outs and details. If you want to ever build an X-ray setup, this is probably your first go-to place for, for doing so. If you're really interested, find me. I have more brief references, but that's the most important one, I would say. I mean, see, what was the approximate cost of what he did? Um, I actually don't know. I think it, 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 the, the point is this is a dental X-ray source. Um, so that's something, you yeah, should say that. So one cheap way of doing is getting a dental x-ray source. Actually, it can be an old dental x-ray source, which is not used. So dental x-ray sources also get lower and lower in energy, and sometimes the doctors throw them out because they have a new system. If you can get some system like that, you already have half your, of your, almost half of your equipment. I don't know what they paid for that, but I would assume that if you buy a new one, you're somewhere in the 30,000 euro or dollar range, something like that. But don't name it on a number. Um, on the other side, the flat panel detector is what you need. If you buy new ones, you easily can spend also $20,000 on that. But there's another trick. You can use scintillator screens and adjust a normal CCD high-speed camera or a normal CCD camera and, and true that. I'll show you in a second. And you need a rotating table. A rotating table comes starting $1,000 or something. You get probably something that you buy. So if you build it yourself, uh, you can get the price tag definitely down in a 50K region again. That's another circuit tomograph, actually, in Dan Goldman's lab, who's also a frequent um, lecturer here. So he was actually studying ants building tunnels inside of granular media. And he had used also an, an X-ray source. I think it's also a dental one and a little rotation stage. And he just used that. He had a de detector screen, and he visualized that with a normal camera. And then he could do tomographies. And what you can see here is three times the, the, the system of tunnels stuck by the ants in there as a function of time. And he also gives some information how he did that. So yeah, he said he's this Philips X-ray system, and he has a high-speed camera phantom, which is very pretty cool. And there's, a, there's different open source software to actually do the reconstruction. And then it's using Oscar, but I know for sure there's at least one other very well-developed system which you can use open access, open source materials. So yes, if you're dedicated, you can definitely build such a setup yourself. You can also do the reconstruction about five lines of math. You can do that with MATLAB. I've, I've done it. But um, if, if you really want to have all the bells and whistles, I would go for some of the yeah, two sets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, so you can either use Oscar or you can just go direct to, to Mike and, and get his code. <laughs> um, there's two other options I want to mention. One of them is international collaboration. So you might not have direct access to such a machine. But the fact is that typically the data acquisition takes something like one, two days, and then you leave with a hard disk with 100 of gigabyte to terabyte of data. And then you have about two years where you sit in front of your desktop and write programming code and analyze that. So it's not too hard to find someone who has a tomography setup which lets you take data for one or two days in terms of collaboration. I think we'll have a special session on that later in this week or next week where you actually speak about that type of collaborations. And there's a final option that is apply for beam tunnel synchrotrons. We already had talked about this this morning. Um, it's also not really the spirit of the hands-on school, and I would also not advise it as a first way of doing tomography, because synchrotron beam time is only given to people which can prove they can't do their science with a stationary machine. And if you have not done any tomography, proving that you cannot do it with a stationary machine will be really, really hard. This is something if you can prove that, for example, you need many, many images, very high short exposure times, or something like that, then you can move to that. But collaboration is definitely something to take into account. OK, I have about five minutes left. Um, let me make a couple of points in, in, in passing. So one of them is I um, think there's something which we really as a community do not use enough, and that's sharing data, open data. If we have taken this data, for example, from packings of, sorry, from packings of, of, of tetrahedra or ellipsoids, um, this took us a long time to take them, and analyzing them and running the software took even longer. And now they're somewhere sitting on our hard drive, and no one else can ever use them. 
we should, as a community, much more start to share our raw data for other people having different ideas and use repositories like Dryad. Zenodo and, and uh, the CERN is another one of those. Um, I think this should become almost obligatory for everyone using such type of equipment to actually later on give the data out. The other thing is, that's a very special remark for the hands-on lecture. If you've not done it yet and you're coming, bring your own sample. You will, have, you will write your own code, but you will also have a chance to take your own tomography with this machine. So bring some small sample. The size should be about, yeah, like, like I said, this little box, this little plastic box I have here. Could be a little bit smaller. Try to avoid metal. Um, plastic is better. And this, for example, was a little wooden dog, dig, and now you can see one slice for the tomography. You can very nicely see the fiber of the wood in here. You can see that the, the, uh, the furnish is something made, of the, the, the color on the outside is made by some other material, which must be much denser, otherwise it wouldn't be actually being so much denser here in, 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 in the x-rays. You can see a little bit of the rope connecting those, so you get a very nice insight of other things. I not recommend bringing LA electronics like USB sticks, which you still plan to use because we already killed integrated circuits with x-rays. So don't put in your smartphone. Um, then I promised to speak about one of the reasons why beam hardening is such a nuisance. What you see here is a cardboard tube which is filled with paper shavings from a document shredder. And you can see in the radiogram very nicely, there's a piece of a clip, of a paper clip, which has been used to clip that together. The radiogram, no big deal. A little piece of metal, it's dark. You can see that. But let me show you the tomography reconstruction of that. So we're going for the paper shreds. And now you see over here, there's something really bright, and there's radiating lines coming out of that. And these radiating lines, these are the typical beam hardening artifacts. Whenever you have something which is much higher in density, the, 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 the X-ray tomography reconstruction algorithm assumes basically that your mu is not changing a lot, and it's not, definitely not having beam hardening. Now, if you have something in there which is beam hardening, the reconstruction goes weird, and, and, and there is no real way to fix that in software. I mean, there are some algorithms which try to do that, but honestly, they're not really helping a lot at all. So this is one of the reasons why, for things like that, you have to typically go to rather high energies, or you have to use a trick which is called a filter. And that's what you said in the beginning. If I bring some extra material in here, like a little bit of aluminum, I already remove the low energy spectrum. So what I do over here, right before I actually go through my sample, putting in this aluminum filter, I already took out all of those photons. Those photons never take place actually in the actual imaging, but it's still aluminum disk I have put over here. And that improves the beam hardening quite a bit, this filtering. And we're actually doing this also. If you look at the X-ray machine, you will see, you will see that right in front of the X-ray tube, there's a little bit of an aluminum slice, which is a slot piece which actually filters the end coming out. The last three slides I want to show you is, I already said that. You go somewhere, you take images, and you come back with gigabytes, and you need months or years to actually analyze them. The actual problem with x-rays is not so much the image acquisition, because that's mostly turnkey by now for most problems, at least at some places. The actual problem is getting something out of it. Like here we have a sample, for example, this, this little plastic uh, tetrahedra of seven millimeters with a whole container of them. We tap them. We see how they compactify. I can actually show you a movie. So, what we're interested in is how do they change, how do they change the orientation? You see now, the more taps we give the system, all those little tetrahedra change their position, change their orientation. We try to understand the mechanical stability of that sample, to understand that we need to find the position and the orientation of all those little tetrahedra in there. Now, as I already said, this is a photograph of the sample. This is a rendering, that's just meaning we just putting it in an algorithm which sets everything to black or gray, which is intransparent, and the air is made transparent, but nothing has been found here. This is just a picture, so to speak, like that from the x-rays. This is a geometric representation. Here we know from each tetrahedra the send-off mass and the different angles which give its rotation. And going from here to here, from here to here, that's a full PhD. Um, for the expert, for those, you will actually see if you do the image analysis. We have one step there which is called erosion, which very easily separates the particles in the, what you do in the hands-on course. You cannot do erosion over here because you're face-to-face -face contacts. Tetrahedra can lie side by side, and erosion will not get in between them. And by not being able to get in between them, it can also not separate them. So you have to come up with new methods. Once you know how you do it, it's actually rather simple. And if you would have known in the beginning, you could have done it probably in six months. 
but, but figuring out all the ways not to do it and then finally find a way that's made the PhD actually. And um, just to give you an idea, that's actually a PhD of Max Neudegger. So what we actually ended up with doing is the following. We wrote some code. So these are three slices through the cube of volume. Blue means there is some material. Gray means this is air. And then we put in a probe body. The probe body is this yellow tetrahedra over here. And we rotate that probe body and we grow it and we shrivel it around and try to maximize the overlap with the blue. So you can see the projections of the tetrahedra as the orange over here. And at that time, the code was about running in real time. So you can see, okay, it grows, it has found this tetrahedra, and we have an overlap of 99%, we are happy. It grows, it found this tetrahedra, it's happy. Now this guy has a problem, it has to rotate more than it thinks. It takes, it's the steepest ascent algorithm, but at some point it figures out, okay, I have to rotate around. Oh, now it's switching in, and again, we get an overlap of 99.8% of the volume. This way, we identify all of these different tetrahedra in there, a detection rate of 99% or something like that. Um, but as I said, this, this is the hard part, and that also means if you're interested in doing quantitative science with X-ray tomography, you actually have to be able to group programming. Okay, thank you for your attention.